Hello, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. So today's special guest is Dr. Babek Azizadeh, a facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon who has focused on treatment of individuals with facial paralysis and Bell's palsy. Now, he is director of the Facial Paralysis Institute and associate clinical professor of facial plastic and reconstructive surgery at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Now, Dr. Azizadeh has been featured in The New York Times, Discovery Health, Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Oz, and The Doctor's television shows for his unique expertise. He is co-author of the textbook, Facial Nerve, and has published numerous peer-reviewed articles and speaks nationally and internationally on facial paralysis. Now, he's also ex actively involved in several humanitarian causes and founder of the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation. Dr. Azizadeh, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. Thank you, Catherine. So excited to be here, and thank you for the kind intro. Sure, no problem. Um, I didn't. I mean, I've known you for a very long time. I just thought you were. I just thought you were a facial plastic surgeon doing facelifts and rhinos. I had no idea that you were so specialized. Can you just follow the journey of how did you evolve into facial paralysis specialty? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's an unusual area of expertise and um um it's a especially i think in private practice uh not many people really have uh this as a big part of their practice when i started out after finishing fellowship almost 20 years ago uh or a little more than 20 years ago um i really 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 loved um you know, managing individuals who had, you know, uh, reconstructive needs. Obviously, um, the facelifts and rhinoplasty have and were and continue to be a big source of my practice and income. But the facial paralysis patients were really, really special, the kids and adults. And I had a unique approach in managing them from both uh, the reconstructive and the aesthetic side. And, you know, that just continued to grow. And I was fortunate enough to kind of develop a really nice niche in this area. Well, on your, I didn't even know you still did even aesthetic surgery because when I looked for you online, um, all I saw was facial paralysis and Bell's palsy. I did not see anything, except I saw an Instagram post where, she, you were doing like nerve damage surgery, and sure enough, she got a facelift at the meantime <laughs> to for yeah. symmetry. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. So, we, like, how much of your practice is aesthetic versus reconstructing? It's about, I would say, uh, 50 50 um, in terms of uh, the aesthetic versus the reconstructive side. Um, and um, it's, it's interesting because uh, obviously, with the number of uh, uh, facelifts going up, revision facelifts happening, nerve damage that's, you know, a little bit more prevalent now with the deeper procedures and more involved procedures. So I end up doing quite a bit of revision facelifts um, and complicated facelifts in addition to the facial nerve related issues that sometimes come up, in addition to obviously just uh, routine um, uh, facial reanimation procedures. So it's a, it's actually a very, very interesting balance and expertise that I have because of the way that the aesthetic practice has moved. So the, would you say, um, like the facial paralysis, I didn't even know it was such a big deal. I mean, I, when I looked on your website, the one, so you must have different websites. Is the Facial Paralysis Institute one part of your practice? And then you have this other aesthetic side of your practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Facial Paralysis Institute is kind of almost a, a standalone process and uh, entity. Um, and it's kind of a multi-specialty center with, oculoplastic surgeons, neurotologists, head and neck surgeons, and so forth. But my own private practice is kind of the, uh, has the components of both the aesthetic and reconstructive. 
Okay, so then regarding the setup of your practice, is it a solo practice within UCLA? Are they two separate buildings? No, I'm a, I'm a clinical faculty at UCLA, and I have an appointment also at Cedar sinai So both of those institutions, uh, I do most of my surgeries at a freestanding uh, ambulatory surgery center. Uh, and the more involved uh, inpatient procedures I do at Cedar sinai but I'm on clinical faculty at UCLA. So I have a little bit of, because I trained there and I still uh, am pretty involved with, uh, with uh, residency programs, both at Cedar sinai and uh, also uh, with journal clubs through UCLA and so forth. So you live in both worlds. You live in the solo practice world as well as the university world. Yeah, I mean, I would say I have a very tertiary academic practice in a private practice world. Okay. Do you find that hard to juggle? No, no. I, I mean, I've been, I'm lucky because it's very hard to develop this because it takes more time and it's a little bit more complicated and the resources you have to pay for yourself. You don't have the university with a lot of resources that they give to their faculty. But, um, you know, for me, ultimately, uh, that's the freedom that private practice gave me to do whatever I want. And I kind of am doing that. So is it kind of like your passion is the facial paralysis and the aesthetic kind of supports that? Is it set up I like- I love both. I love the aesthetic. I love the reconstructive. I think if I did 100% of each, I probably wouldn't be as good for each of those because they really- complement one another and the technical expertise that I've developed doing both aesthetic and reconstructive have helped the other area. And I'd probably be a little bit bored. I like both. Uh, I really, I don't want to do too many things because then you can't be great at them. And I don't want to do anything that I can't be great at, but just enough of, you know, both co uh, components that I've really been able to, um, uh, uh make me a better surgeon, better outcomes, and uh, keep my practice really fresh and exciting. And I love going into uh, my office every day, and I love every surgery that I do. Wow. <laughs> Not everyone can I say know, that. It's a rarity. It's a rarity. But it's, you know, by design. I mean, I've always tried to continue, like, over 20 years. I just didn't want to create, like, a situation where it was, like, a just – you know, a mill where you just go in and you do your facelift or rhinoplasty and you go home. So I've always like tried to kind of keep um, doing the things that I really, 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 really love and at a volume that's very sustainable for me without getting burnt out and with paying enough and great attention to the patients. And so uh, that's hard to do and, and a mix that that you enjoy doing. Well, the, um, how big of a demand is this facial paralysis and Bell's palsy? I, I mean, if you look at your stuff, it looks like it's a big epidemic almost. But Or, on the other hand, I read something like you're the only surgeon on, in the world or something who knows this as well as you do. Is that true? Well, I, uh, I've developed surgeries and pioneered procedures and have been doing it for quite a bit of time. Uh, and I would say it's uh, not common, but I have you know a referral center and a tertiary practice. So I see a lot of patients with these issues. Now, Bell's palsy on its own, you know, can happen and it does happen often. One in 40,000 people, um, on an annual basis get Bell's palsy, but the majority of those individuals recover completely, but a small percentage have some residual impact that does require treatments, surgery, et cetera. That's amazing. I, it, that's amazing. Uh, so what would you say, I'm just gonna tell you from my point of view, I find it as a consultant, when I go into a practice, the, the practice that is uh, catering to the aesthetic patient with the credit card, as well as, the reconstructive patient who has an insurance card and some serious needs, the other patient has some wants, <laughs> these people have some needs. I find that very hard to juggle 
um, yeah. and give them the same type of patient experience, but also an aesthetic patient sitting next to, let's say, a Bell's palsy patient. I just I know that I am that patient, that consumer patient, and I, I honestly I think I would separate them um, as much as possible. Like, what have you found? I haven't done that, um, and um, again, I I treat you know every every patient whether they're coming in for Bell's palsy or for a facelift the same way um, with super super high level concierge type boutique uh, approach which uh, has been phenomenal for both the reconstructive and the aesthetic patients I mean we I don't have you know, hundreds of patients flowing through uh, my office. I keep a very tight schedule. Um, I've really never had anyone say, oh my God, I was sitting next to someone that was like this or that. I think my patients know that they're coming to someone who is uniquely skilled and uh, they have uh, patients that are coming from all over the world to see them. And they're just kind of happy to be there. Um, now, the aesthetic patients um, tend to be a little bit more word of mouth. Patients that are referred from other patients uh, um, or other physicians and dermatologists uh, who, you know, when patients refer patients to you, they're like, hey, I went to this guy. He was able to do this surgery that you know, with minimal to no risk compared to other surgeons because of his expertise and facial nerve understanding. And so if you're a facelift patient and, um, you know, there's a 5% chance of a potential temporary facial nerve injury that, you know, that goes down to almost zero coming to me, patients are really, really happy. And they ultimately, it's a visual process. And when they see your results and they like your results, they really, you know, don't discern. Now, if I had patients whose eyes were, so you know, out of their socket, their face, you know, had jawbone reconstruction, that would be a different situation. Even though my first five years, I did have that, and that didn't really impact it either. But um, for the most part, um, I think I've been able to manage that really, really well without a, um, without any really negative repercussions on my practice for either either area. Okay. You know what normally happens though? Um, the staff you bring on, if you, oftentimes you bring on medical staff and they have that medical clinical mindset, let's say, then, but then you say boutique practice and customer service, and that's a completely different kind of mindset. How have you trained your staff or have you had any trouble finding staff that can live up to your philosophy, you know? Of um, how I mean, there's always difficulty in, you know, bringing in staff, whether it's medical or boutique or hospitality. I mean, I always look at people from a perspective of not medical, but hospitality, because that really ends up being what we're doing, which is um, you know, providing exceptional service, but they do need to understand whether it's, again, if you're doing rhinoplasty face, blepharoplasty, if someone has a uh, orbital hematoma, they got to be able to help with that. Otherwise that cosmetic patient can go blind. So everyone needs to understand, um, hospitality in my office. Everyone understands, uh, HIPAA and privacy and everyone understands that we're not, you know, in a med spa. We are, you know, we're in a, you know, medical oriented. We care about our patients. There's an empathy portion to it. So I tend to find, you know, people who kind of fill into that component. It's hard to do. I pay them very, very well. And I've had staff, you know, my, my top two people who've been with me have been with me 16 years and 14 years. So, um, you know, I have been able to, uh, you know, surround myself with people who understand exactly what I want, but I'm also very, very clear about my expectations on what I want. And if someone isn't going to be there, you know, that's fine. You know, they just move on. 
or if not, that, that doesn't fit their need. But I don't actually hire anyone from a medical perspective. So you hire like on personality and train on medical. Yeah. I train everyone. No one sees, no one does anything until they've been with me for a few months, you know? So everyone pretty much has, you know, I've had one, maybe two people come from other medical practices. Most people have come just from other walks of life. Mm -hmm. I, I say that all the time. I, I'm looking for personality traits and um, characteristics, um, things like um, people skills, um, loyalty, um, that, that go-getter kind of attitude and um, uh, uh, people who care about people, you know, because you can always train the other part, but you can't train the personality traits. Yeah, so. it's character and personality are very difficult and work ethic. I think there are three things that, you know, are really, really difficult to train anyone on. Uh, but, you know, you can train them, you know, to do, to put someone in a room, take photos, you know, and so forth. How do you train them though? Because or how do you keep them motivated? That's even a better question. Because you've had people 14 and 16 years. Yeah. Um, is there any bonus instruction? Um, any incentives happening? Uh, fun meetings, fun out outings? Yeah. So I have uh, I've tried everything. Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna say I know everything, but I've tried everything. What works? And uh, different different individuals and different time periods require different uh, management styles. I manage, I have a phenomenal manager in my practice who I trust and I let her, who, you know, she's been with me for 16 years. She's done every job in the office. So she knows everything related and she's like family. She, you know, I treat her like family. She treats me like family. We're like really, um, you know, extremely close. And I have another, uh, my surgery coordinator, same thing. We're like family. She knows exactly what I want. She knows how to treat my patients the way that I want. Um, and they then are the leaders that find the right team members, decide who gets promoted with my input, you know, and so forth. But I let them really manage the practice and not, I don't get involved in too many of the minutia. Um, and they do a great job. And there's some, uh, uh, employees that, you know, and I think over the last three, four years since COVID, things have changed a little bit. Um, I think uh, financially, it's always important, but, you know, quality of life factors, other processes are now a little bit more important. Um, so we just kind of determine what that individual's role is and incentivize them. Everyone is on an incentive program. Everyone is a bonus program. And everyone gets paid above, I would say, maybe way above what my colleagues or peers pay their employees. Um, because I don't like turnover. If I find someone phenomenal, I want them to stay with me as long as possible. So, uh, and, you know, I don't, you know, of course, the bottom line is really important, but I'm not that much of a stickler to that. I like quality of life more importantly than the bottom line. Uh, and I, I always say, please hang on to somebody who's really good. It's going to cost you a fortune to replace them and start over again. Um, I mean, I, I would do everything you can possibly do. I like incentives in today's world. Um, I do a lot of hiring and I was just doing some hiring in Beverly Hills. Everyone down there seems to know the word hybrid. Is this a hybrid position? And it's so funny. I'm like, the heck's a hybrid position. Sure enough, they want to work virtually. And I said, I'm sorry, this is a customer service practice. Like we yeah. need to patients. And are you hearing that at all? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, we, when we um, look for employees, they know it's full-time in-house, you yeah. know, it, it, I see it right in the the medical they... practice. I mean, I don't, again, you could have the most foo-foo, you know, uh, practice in the world. It's still, you got to be there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The staff need to be there. I mean, we always give flexibility. It's not like we're, you know, um, you know, we'll work with our staff if there's something going on. I mean, we're like, it's a small boutique place, like I said. So, uh, but yeah, no, everyone, you know, uh, understands it's not hybrid. I don't think it'll ever be hybrid. It just doesn't work that way um, for a medical practice. 
Um, I do know some of the practices who are trying to make that work, um, even overseas. Uh, the patient care coordinator is hybrid <laughs> or actually completely virtual. They don't even meet the patient. They just phone call. The doctor meets the patient, and then the coordinator calls the patient after they send them the quote. And I think, what are you talking about? Um, I just think if you take away the humanness of this industry, then you are going to be commoditized and it's all going to be about price if you're not going to bring your personality with. And I'm just surprised by that, but good, good for you. I mean, uh, there'll be a lot of different iterations, I think, as we move forward. I mean, healthcare is changing. Uh, plastic surgery will be changing. The way we practice medicine today is going to be very different than in 10 years. Uh, I don't know what that change will be, but it will be different. But there are certain facets that are really, really important. It's the human touch. It's the physician's touch. It's your staff. It's you know managing um, you know uh, how you manage the patients. I do believe the human touch is very important. Uh, but um, but I do think there will be changes, and you know uh, to a point that's it's going to look very different in ten years. How you're you know you're meeting your doctors seeing your doctors, interacting with their staff, non-clinical. Uh, it will be different. Now, is that going to be great for the patients? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it'll be more convenient, but less human touch. Uh, and maybe a younger generation will love that because they just don't like, you know, as much of, you know, um, the inconvenience as maybe our generation is more like I'm okay, you know, waiting an hour to see a doctor and, you know, another hour in traffic because I really want to see their eyes and how they're going to talk to me, you know? Um, I'm all about convenience and time savings, but I do know if we're not going to connect, if, if we're not going to connect, I'm going to think differently about deciding to stick with this or somebody else who does give me the warm and fuzzies. So it's just a balance like everything else. Yeah. And I think it's going to be way sooner than 10 years. Things are changing. So fast. Oh, yeah, they're changing fast. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say like with, with the, the way you're growing your practice is um, what's the biggest challenge you have? I mean, I think up until about a year or two ago, I think the, um, the, the, staffing and employee challenge was it was a big change after covid um i think um it's going back a little bit more to pre covid uh it might from my i you know i don't know if it's true but from what i'm sensing um um i mean i think for all plastic surgeons the challenge is going to be, are you going to stay ahead of the curve with technology, with the changes that are happening, like we talk, we're talking about in the office space, uh, with uh, competition, obviously. Uh, so those are challenges that are always going to be there. And it's, in fact, it's been there for the last 20 years. Uh, I think uh, the, the way our... Um, you know, our mentors started their practice and developed it. And once it was developed, it was done. They were like really safe and they got this tremendous, you know, recurring patient base that's gone. Uh, you know, you could be the hottest facelift surgeon one day and in three months, you may be done. You know, someone else will come and take your throne, you know, because, uh, you know, it's just, that's, that's the challenge. And I think it's the, uh, it's, you know, also opportunities, obviously, for younger surgeons. Uh, but it's also, you know, it's just everything's moving at a, you know, speed of light. And it would be, you know, it would be nice where you don't have to like constantly be thinking about what do I need to do to stay where I'm at. But overall, I think, you know, we're still, we have the best profession in the world. You know, I like, it, there aren't too many jobs where you can make a good living, take care of patients, be respected in the community, uh, be doing cutting edge, innovative, you know, and have some spotlight on you. So 
it's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, profession. And we're very, very lucky to be in it. Um, speaking of the spotlight, you had some pretty good PR. And um, everyone always, the doctors always ask me, how do you get that? How do you do that? And I said, well, you typically pay to play or, or some, you know somebody, somebody knows somebody. So can we just talk about the PR for a minute? And is it all it's cracked up to be? Is it a one hit wonder kind of thing that lasts your 15 minutes of fame? Um, is it just good for your website? T tell us about PR. Yeah. I mean, I was lucky because very early in my career, I got on Oprah. How? And well, because I was referred a patient that had been on Oprah and they wanted to do a follow up on that. And it ended up being like a very, very, very. Now, if it was today, it would have been very different because at that time, they wouldn't even let you take your cam phone into the studio. How crazy is that, right? Now, all these shows, they're like, oh, hashtag this, hashtag that. But um, I think PR is becoming less and less important because it's not 15 minutes of fame. It's 15 seconds of fame. Um, no one has, It's uh, things are happening so fast. Um, uh, it is for your social media for the most part because no one's really looking at anything out there. Um, and people pretty much will forget in about a heartbeat and it's on to the next. Um, so um, there is a value for it, of course, uh, but it's, you know, it's how much value, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that today. I think 15, 20 years ago, it was a tremendous value because you didn't have, it was a third party approval of you. For sure. um, and today you have, you know, your social media is your third party, right? How people are commenting this. I mean, it's like a, a, live, pro, a live process. So I'm not quite sure how important it is now. It depends on, you know, you're on. It, it, it's good for the ego. Of course, everyone loves hearing their names on TV shows or on news media. But overall, I would say today it's a little bit different than 10, 15 years ago. Well, I would say you it, probably the better play today is getting a celebrity on your social media channel, you know, yeah. or even an influencer. Are you dabbling in that at all? The influencers? Is I that your media plan? I haven't. I mean, I, I still have, uh, you know, I think the influencer level is very, very good for um, dermatologists and for doctors who are really focused on the non-invasive. Uh, I do do, uh, I believe it or not, I still do my own Botox, not on every one of my patients. I have a, I have an injector uh, PA who does injections, but I like, you know, I like that aspect, you know, fillers and Botox and all that stuff. So I still, but for the most part, that's not an area where I want to have 5 million new patients coming in for that. And I think influencers from that perspective are good. I don't know, you know, from a surgical perspective, I haven't done it, but I don't have any, you know, negative or positive comments on it. I just don't know the the credence that well because you're in beverly hills or down in la um a couple of the surgeons actually have added it to the patient intake form um the number of instagram followers you have oh that's interesting yeah and um some of them like it's that's how you get into that practice that's <laughs> but interesting. I think, hmm. yeah i yeah i haven't done that but that's a that's a good thing to right have. yeah i agree i think that's cool <laughs> so um how much time are you spending on social media? Well, I have someone in my office that basically will, I approve everything, but I don't have time. I mean, I have some friends who spend 20, 30 hours a week yeah. and they're really successful and they do a great job. And I think it really helps them, but I haven't had that. I, I just don't have that. Maybe the patience for that much social media but no we have have a have, have a team of uh, you know people who 
Like, you know, I care more about my before and afters because I publish a lot in, you know, publications. So I, I do that fairly well. And we'll do social media. I like social media, but I don't, it's not my like livelihood that I behind it. So what marketing channels are working best for you? I would assume some social media, some, well, you probably need social media for the reach for the um, facial paralysis. Would you say? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing social media, I think since the beginning of social media, but really mo more focused on the educational aspect of it. Uh, not so much, you know, into my personal life type thing. So, um, so uh, I think it's very important. I think it's the most important thing right now. Uh, you know, uh, websites are important, not as much, but people do search to see what's going on with that. So, uh, so both are still critical, but I would say social media more than. I was on your Instagram, and it, again, I think it was more facial paralysis because did you have two different social media yeah. channels? Yeah, I have a my own personal one, which is VR Aziza Day, and then I have a Facial Paralysis Institute. Because uh, I was going to say, you have yeah. so many before and after photos on the facial paralysis. Yeah. I thought, how the heck did you do that? Do you have a secret for getting them to approve their photos? Um, no, I mean, I just we we we, we just ask if they're okay, and if they are, they they are, and if they're not, then we don't we don't you know, use, use them. What a concept, but you actually ask. <laughs> so do yeah, you pretty much, we just say, do we, you know, and their photo consent, do we, we ask, you know, if you're okay with posting before and afters and social media. And if you're not, we just use it for charting. Yeah. And, well, it's amazing know. because you're able to do it. And other doctors say, there's no way my patients aren't like that. And I said, but that's, I don't think that's true because a guy a mile away from you <laughs> gets a ton of them. So I don't know what the secret is because some practices are very good at collecting the consents and some practices, I think it's in their heads. They, they just think the patients will not because they probably wouldn't. Maybe that's what it. I mean, I have a lot of patients who don't. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we generally just, uh, they're pre. But, you know, that may also be, you know, part of what you were talking about, that like connectivity, the staff, getting to know them, all of that stuff, it becomes, you know, maybe a little bit easier to accept. Um, uh, but I have a lot of patients who don't, and that's fine. I mean, everyone's, you know, this is going, you know, in perpetuity on in the world. So I get it if someone doesn't want to have their photos online. <laughs> Well, you have enough to say yes, because it looks like, I mean, from a, um, outside in, you know, from the, looking from yeah. the in, outside in, um, it looks like you have plenty of patients who just love you and they love the results. And um, so you're doing a great job there. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, is there anything else that um, any other marketing channels, like, are you getting a lot of doctor referrals? Do you live off of no. that? Or are you advertising? How are you? No. Are you going international? Or are you also going yeah. out? I mean, I, I don't advertise. Uh, I get a lot of doctor referrals. I get a lot of patient referrals. Uh, a lot of dermatologists refer, like a lot of uh, my, like my facelifts and I do a lot of, you know, rhinoplasty in young adults and teenagers. All of those are either patient referred or doctor referred. Pretty much, very few come from social media or web, um, and uh, so uh, and uh, facial paralysis. I would say half are doctor referred and patient referred. The other half find me, and I do have a very very large international practice, and uh, you know also from all over the country uh, as well. You know, so it's it's a nice it's it's great because it's a nice balance and mix. Uh, but my patients are very nice. I have a very, very nice group of patients, both my aesthetic and my uh, recon. They're, they're, they're just on average, very, very nice, great people. Because, because they're coming referred, you know, they're not stranger patients on the internet saying, who are you? Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, that's how to do this. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I know you've always talked about that. Yeah. 
it's so much easier to run a practice that um that they're they're doing the sales for you you know yeah. just bragging but it's about very them. hard i mean that's that's very hard to do and i think a doctor who's coming out into practice today in private it's very hard to do that because it's so much easier to do the social media and get those those patients so i agree i could see how it's just because it's years of building trust in the community not just your local but national and international community it's years of publishing it's years of presenting it's years of taking care of patients it doesn't happen overnight so it's it's you know still very old school <laughs> because that's how you know people in that era did but uh, it just takes a long long time whereas social media is like very quick and instantaneous and it's just much easier to put the effort into your social media rather than publishing a paper or going and giving talks or going and talking to you know uh, colleagues and hanging out so that's it's 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 you know it's there's an art to it but it's also it takes a lot of energy effort to build that well when you're brand new you have time and nothing else so you might as well yeah. put it into social media because otherwise you're going to play against somebody who's putting 20 grand into google adwords you know and yeah. how are you going to compete um I wouldn't want to be coming out at, in this time. I think it's late yeah, tomorrow. I think differently. I actually think differently. I think it's much easier now than before. Yeah. Because patient expectation, like 20 years ago, you had to build your portfolio before and afters before somebody would even walk in the door. Right? Now you don't really have to show before and afters. You just have to show, you know, uh, the instruments, <laughs> you know, and like your home life or your car or your this or that to draw that that attention. So I actually think it's easier than before, but the, the you know, I think it's it's challenging to find the right practice mix of patients that you're looking for. A little bit harder because it's gonna, uh, you know, it's gonna be more social media driven. So I don't know. Maybe I'm. Uh, that's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But well, I do. I know. Um, when I got into this 24 years ago, the new guys used to just hook up with the guys who had the 20 years, and um, they would carry them for a long time. You know, because we used to say it takes 10 years to build your own practice to go out on your own, or to or to buy that other guy's practice. You know, you yeah. got to have some some credibility there. Yeah. Um, so they would just live off of the other, the, the older surgeon, you know, and now you, you, you're just jumping right into the fire and you have about 10 months instead of 10 years. Yeah. This off. And I think, dear Lord, I mean, there's, there's some effort that goes into that. And some of the people are so good at it. Some of the younger guys have just gravitated towards it. Um, I, I think if you keep, can be mind, um, open-minded, I think you can do okay, but it is so generational now. I, the thought of, Social media, I'm kicking and screaming. It's not my thing. I don't, it's not my thing, you know, but I do it, but it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't grow up with it. But, you know, like what you're doing now, podcasts, that's I'm really a modern, that. that's a modern way of, you know, um, you know, I remember like you would always have lectures and stuff like that at, at the academy meetings and so forth. And I know you still do that, but your reach can be year round with podcasts. It's just a long format social media that you've been able to really do it nicely and I think put information out there. And it's the same thing I think for for the, you know, for the younger doctors, I think they just have a lot of opportunities. They do have time. The reach can be much much larger than, you know, our reach was 20 years ago which was very local. Mm -hmm. um so it's different but i i actually think i still do think that right now is easier to come out and build a practice uh, because a lot of those hanging on to a doctor that was out 20 years didn't work out either you know <laughs>
you know, you would go and hang out for five years, six years, seven years, and you're like, oh, oops, I just sold my practice to some other person who just gave me a little bit more a lot of money. <laughs> money. So that also didn't work that well. That's so true. Or the um the mature surgeon said he's going to be retiring in five years. The five years he's there, I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, all of that can go sideways. Speaking of which, have the private equity people hit you up yet? <laughs> I mean, I think um, private equity is going to be a big, uh, big um, topic over the next two, three years. Yeah. In the plastic surgery, right now it's huge in the med spa space, but it will be in plastic surgery and germ, obviously, but it will be in plastic surgery. Um, and we have, you know, we have a little project working on that, uh, but uh, nothing imminent. All right. So we're getting ready to wind down, but I love to ask my new question is, give us a crazy, your craziest patient or staff story that you care to share. Oh, <laughs> before we start, I told you, I'm not that exciting. And my staff were, one time we got asked, and this is not the answer to your question. One time we got asked to be on some like really, really dramatic uh, Bravo TV show. And I was like, I, I would love to be on this show, but we are just so boring. You're going to cut out every little segment. There Wait, is what was the drama. topic? There's no drama uh, of that of that level. I mean, I I honestly have not had any anything I was like oh my god this patient did this and I was you know uh, you know you have sometimes patients who shouldn't be having plastic surgery and trying to talk them out of it sometimes takes me like two hours because I don't you know I, I never I try to really explain things so my office staff is always mad at me and they know if I'm in a room for two hours I'm like talking someone out of surgery so for the most part, I, I really haven't had anything too dramatic in my, thank God. Knock Good on wood. for you. Knock on wood. Okay, so, then can you tell us anything interesting that we don't know about you? Um, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe people know this. Um, um, I love my, uh, my coffee and coffee breaks. So my staff always know that if I'm missing, I'm like running down to the coffee shop to get my like macchiato or espresso. So that's that's kind of my vice, <laughs> my my uh, two or three uh, caffeinated drinks a day. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm boring. Okay. That, that's that I am like, yeah, I am like very, very low maintenance and boring. I would so. actually like my facial surgeon to be very boring. Yeah. yeah. Sleep. Yeah. No bad habits. Yeah. If you're going to rearrange my face, I'd like you to be 100% good to go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I am like, yeah, I, I definitely fit that bill more than <laughs> anything else. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, I, Oh, I don't drive a car. I don't own a car. How's that? That's in LA? That. I live in Los Angeles. I do not own a car. How is that possible? Because after COVID, during COVID, we, my wife and I returned her car. And then we had one car between us. And then she started driving. I walked to work. And then it became a game of how long I can go without owning a car. And now it's like three and a half years in. Oh and I feel have, I'll get rides from my wife. I'll get rides from friends. I'll walk everywhere. I Uber everywhere. And it's 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 been actually very nice. Really? I find that fascinating. Good for you. See here. Uh, a boring answer, but fascinating. Any. <laughs> I just don't see how you live in LA without a car. Yeah, um, no, I you... mean, there are cars in our household, but I don't own a car. My okay. wife has a car and my son, who's a high school student, has a car. But... How long? <laughs> That's crazy. How long does it take you to walk to work? Uh, 15, 20 minutes. No kidding. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Okay. 
All right, good for you. So um, we're going to wrap it up. I know that your website, one of your websites is facialparalysisinstitute.com. But if any of the doctors wanted to um, connect with you, what would be the best way to do so? Yeah, they can just DM me through my Instagram, Dr. Azizadeh. So that's probably the easiest way. Gotcha. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Azizadeh. And I will be seeing you, I'm assuming, at a conference coming up soon. And everybody, if you have any questions or comments or feedback for me, please leave them on my website at katherinemailey.com. Or you can certainly DM me as well on Instagram at MBA. Thanks so much. And we'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.